Good morning. Good morning. I want you to take a moment, look around, take note of who isn't here. Give them a call. Let them know that you missed them. Let them know that their presence here does not go unnoticed and, and their absence is felt. Let them know you're thinking about them, that the body of Christ, that the family at Jesus Community Church loves them. <coughs> Um, we are starting a new series um, we're going to be talking about the feasts the feast is given to Israel in the Hebrew Bible Leviticus uh, can anybody tell me what feast just wrapped up this week Tabernacle. I'm what was that nothing that was a couple weeks ago. Sukkot. Say that again louder, Jeannie. Sukkot. Sukkot. Tabernacles. Yeah, it Feast was? of Tabernacles, yes. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Awesome. Now, before we get into this, though, I want to explain a couple things. Because some of you, if you grew up in the, the same church mentality, the same church culture that I did, this doesn't apply to us, so why do we bother? Because that was for the Jews and for their time. But we need to remember as Christians, first, that God chose the Jews through whom He would bless the world. He chose Jesus Christ as His Son. He chose that He would be born a Jew. And knowing that He never sinned, He, he never violated the law morally or, or civilly or criminally, we know that Jesus kept the feasts according to the commandments that were given. So, one, it's good for us to understand what's going on. Because we've got to remember that throughout what we call the Old Testament, God was establishing a foundation upon which He would build the church, His bride. And as such... We spend all of our time looking at stained glass windows, never appreciating the foundation that makes those windows secure. We, we tend to look at those things that attract us, that, that we want to focus on. We, we are discrediting those things that make what we like secure. We cannot have a New Testament gospel without an Old Testament upon which it was built. So that's the first part. We need to understand what God was doing. But, but God didn't just leave things there, did He? Because when God established things in the Old Testament, it was always as a picture of something to come. Okay? And the feasts beautifully illustrate this. Alright, so if you have your Bibles, open to Leviticus chapter 23. Okay, just a, a little caveat here that I want to add. Uh, we are not subject to the adherence of these feasts because to the Christian, every day is holy. They all belong to God. That's one of those things that really irks me. Is when somebody says, oh, 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 Halloween, you know, the church stole that from the devil. It wasn't his to begin with. All days are God's. Which day does not belong to Him? The church took back something the enemy tried to steal. Alright? So all days belong to God. We understand Paul says that, that uh, whatever we do, we do it as unto God. Whether it be celebration of Sabbath, whether it be a new moon, a new moon feast, we celebrate as unto God. Okay? So, Leviticus 23. I'm going to read this through, and then I got to, before we actually dive into the feast, I need to do a little bit of background for you. So let's start reading, and then I'll, I'll kind of back up. Chapter 23, starting in verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations, 
They are my appointed feasts. First thing to note right off the bat, whose feasts are they? God's. God is offering, He's opening up an invitation for Israel to come and join Him in His feasts. Okay? We, we see a, a corollary to this later in the New Testament when Jesus tells the parable uh, of the wedding feast. And, and the, the day of the wedding feast came and, and none of the guests showed up. They just, the, the, the master just got excuses. Oh, I, I, I've got this to do. And oh, this, this came up. And, and so he opened up the feast. He sent his servants out to whoever was out in the street and invited them to come in. Okay, so the first thing we have to understand is these are not Israel's feasts. These are God's feasts. Okay? So moving on. The first feast. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So first thing you need to understand is, is that God puts the Sabbath as His. It's His day. Okay? We're going to get into this a little bit further in a minute, but, but you need to understand, God didn't forget something and then stick this in there. To, oh yeah, I forgot. Well, you also got to do the Sabbath. There, there's a continuation of thought from the beginning to the end here. So at the, the start of the feasts, something that we take as, as just kind of a regular event, we, we have a church on Sunday, but the Sabbath is, is actually on Saturday. That was the day that, that God rested after creation was complete. Okay, so the Sabbath. Uh, verse 4. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Okay, so the first feast, marking the, the new year. As a matter of fact, we read back in Exodus that, that when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, it was such a dynamic thing that he said, this is the start of your new year. I'm changing your calendar because this is so important. Okay? So, Passover, and, and some people say these are actually two feasts. The Feast of Passover, and then the next day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, others say that it's really just one entity that, that is comprised of a specific day that is followed up with a week ending on the following Sabbath. So, so, don't stress about it. Um, one or two, either way, they're here. Okay? So, no ordinary work. Uh, you shall not, uh, you shall present food offerings. Verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, please note that. Please, please note, God is giving it to them. Not because of any inherent worth of Israel, but because God made a promise. Okay? It was God's to give. It's God's to take away. Okay? But we, we look at the politics of today and, oh, who's got the right and who this and who that. Ultimately, what it says right here is God gave it to Israel. Now, he also established some things that, that Israel was supposed to do with the foreigners that came in amongst them. The sojourners and, and so forth. And, and that's a discussion for another time. But, but right here, it's a gift that God has given to you. Okay? Um, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day... When you wave the sheep, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. 
And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the, the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Going on. So we, we now have the Sabbath, the Passover, and, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits. Verse 15. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of the new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, and with uh, their grain offerings and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering, and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your fields right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, I am the Lord your God. Okay, so now we have uh, the Feast of Weeks added to the, the preceding feasts. <clears throat> Verse 23, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. So now we have the Feast of Trumpets. 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present food offerings to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the Day of Atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that day shall be cut off from his people. Kind of get the idea that, that maybe that's important, right? And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall, in, excuse me, you shall afflict yourself uh, on the ninth day of the month, beginning at the evening, from the evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. Okay? So now we have the Day of Atonement. Verse 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord, also known as the, the Feast of Tabernacles, okay, or the Feast of Tents. Uh, on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all of your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn feast, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. I'm sorry, a solemn rest. So let me read that again. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, 
and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generation may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booze when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus, Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. Okay, so that is a lot to take in. Okay, so the, the first thing that we need to do is we need to kind of get our minds right as what's going on here. The, the first thing that we need to do, we need to understand that the, the Hebrew calendar is markedly different than the calendar we use. Okay? Um, would you go ahead and put the first slide up? Um, I, I've done a breakdown of how the Hebrew calendar falls compared to our calendar. And if you look up, we use the Gregorian calendar, which is based off of the solar cycle. It's based on 365 and a quarter days that it takes the earth to go all the way around the sun, okay? Which is why every fourth year we have an extra day so that our, our calendar keeps lined up in the right place because if we didn't have that extra day, eventually we'd be celebrating Christmas in the summer, okay? So um, we use the Gregorian calendar, but the, the Jews, the Hebrew calendar is actually what's called a lunar solar calendar. They base their months off of the moon and, and the time that the moon takes to completely circumnavigate the earth. And so their calendar um, is set up on a 29 and a half day month. Okay, now you go a half day, how does that work? Well, one month they'll do 29 days and the next month they'll do 30. Okay, little bit of a problem here because it doesn't work out mathematically to be the whole year. This is problematic because they actually end up, if you, you do your math, and I've done my math here, um, 29 and a half days spread out over these months comes to a total of, I got it right here, come on, give me a minute. Ah! 354 days. 354. So what do we do with the rest of the days? Well, they added in adjustments. Um, what they do is seven times in a 19-year span, they will add an extra month. Uh, I have difficulty with just a solar calendar, and and you know uh, you know okay, it, what day is it? And and they've got an entire month that comes like every two and three quarter years that they just stick in there. <laughs> okay, and so if we look at this, um, you'll notice on the Hebrew calendar that some of them have. Uh, two names. Uh, one of the names was pre-Babylon. The other name is post-Babylon. So if you're reading in your Bible and you come across two names that, that look like they're for the same thing, it's because of the difference that happened when they went into exile. There's actually a number of differences that came out of that exile. We'll talk about them a little bit as we go on. So their calendar year starts in Nisan. Help me, Jeannie, because I'm guessing on these. Nisan, okay? That is when God, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 11, he has delivered them out of Egypt. And, and he calls them and he says, you will celebrate my Passover. Okay? This day is so important that I'm completely changing your record keeping. This is now New Year's. Okay? So that day falls right in the middle of what would be our March. And it goes to the middle of April. 
Now, in this month, we have three feasts. Okay? Um, well, two feasts, three feasts. It depends how you look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right? The first being Passover. Okay? The second being possibly the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I've heard the arguments both ways. I'm okay with both. So long as you do them the, the way they were supposed to be done. Um, I don't know that it really matters whether it was one or whether it was two. Um, it's okay. Well, I have a brother whose birthday is three days before mine. Consequently, we always celebrated our birthdays together. Um, you know, we, mom and dad would take us out to dinner. We got to pick the place we would go to dinner, which really stunk because he didn't like anything I liked. And, and so, you know, we didn't have him eat first and then me eat first because my birthday came three days later. We, we celebrated it together. So the, the idea being here that Passover was a particular day and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was dependent on, based off of Passover, extended for seven days after. Okay? So then, uh, after that, uh, the day after the Sabbath would be... Um, First fruits, okay? So we have those two. And then 50 days later, in the month of Saban, we have Pentecost. Okay? Now, jumping all the way down to Tishri, um, we have three feasts. Now, Tishri is considered uh, the holy month. As a matter of fact, if you back up to the month of Elul, they actually start preparation for this, this 10... 15 day span in Elul. That's how important because the, the Day of Atonement was of such holy importance to Israel that of their own accord, not a direction, not a directive of God, they backed up into Elul and they spent the 30 days of Elul preparing for the Day of Atonement. Well, But we've got the Feast of Trumpets is stuck there. That's on the first day of Tishri. So what they did is they do the 30 days up to the Feast of Trumpets, and then from the Feast of Trumpets to the Day of Atonement were, were the High Holy Days. And that was where you really had to get yourself ready. So if you missed the thir first 30 days, you got 10 days to catch up. Okay. Now these are not things that are in Scripture. These are things that come out of uh, the rabbinic teachings. Okay. The, the preparation for the 40 days. Um, it is what it is. Uh, it's not called of God, but I'm not going to denigrate or look down on it because quite honestly, I think we all should spend our lives in those 40 days, preferably in those 10 days. I like to dwell in the one day, the Day of Atonement. Okay? So, and then after the Day of Atonement, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which lasts for seven days. Now, if you notice, those are all in red. These are the, the feasts that are declared in Leviticus chapter 23. <laughs> but there are two other feasts that we see in Scripture. Okay? We see the uh, in the month of Kislev, the Feast of Dedication, also known as the Festival of Lights. Okay? This is Hanukkah. Okay? Um, that's not actually a, a directive in Scripture, but what's interesting to note about that is that Jesus celebrated <coughs> the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. And then we have, all right, Jeannie, how do you say that? Purim. Purim, okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I would have botched that one. Purim. Purim, if anybody remembers out of reading your, your Bible, the story of Esther, okay, um, while they were in captivity, um, there was a, an evil man who was very close to the king who plotted to destroy the entire Jewish nation in captivity. His name was Haman. He was an Agagite. Okay? And he, he kind of finagled his way into letting the king, the, the emperor, uh, Xerxes, he, he let him uh, pick a day that all the empire could dedicate to destroying the Jews. And, and so um, Mordecai, who was a holy man who was sitting outside the gate, he heard what was going on. Uh, his niece, who was Esther, her, her Hebrew name was Hadassah, uh, he tells her, uh, she is, she's now the queen, he tells her, hey, you need to intervene on, on behalf of your people. She says, well, I, I can't do that according to law. I can't go before him except that he calls me. My life would be forfeit. 
And then we have the, the famous line, who knows but that you were born for such a time as this. It says if you do this, you know, if you don't, God will raise up deliverance for us on, a, on another, in another place. So she goes, she speaks to the king, she has dinner, then she invites the king and Haman to a, a feast that, that she's going to prepare for them. They, they have three days of fasting and preparation for this. Uh, the only out for her coming before the king without his permission was that he should take his scepter and extend it to her and thus grant her life. This happened. Um, they come to the second feast. She explains what's going on, that she is in fact a Hebrew and that Haman has set it up such that her people will be wiped out. Um, Haman gets what he deserves. Um, the king issues another proclamation and allows the Jews to defend themselves on that day. And as such, we see in the month of... Uh, say, say it, Jeannie? Uh, Adar? Adar? Adar. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Adar. Adar. Um, we see that the Jews were allowed to arm themselves, and they were allowed not just to defend themselves, but they were allowed to go after the people that attacked them. And we see when this happened, they actually wiped out Haman's family. God is just. God knew the evil in the heart of this man. He knew what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. Now, what's really interesting about the book of Esther, of all the books in the Bible, what sets Esther apart? No mention of God. There is no mention of God. Nowhere in the book, there's not a single mention of God. And yet, we see that God was working to preserve his people. Okay? So, um, in the month of Adar, we celebrate, or they celebrate, Purim. Okay, so this, this calendar, if you look down at the bottom, you see there's Veadar, or Veadar, like Darth Veadar. <laughs> uh, this, this was the month that they would stick in <coughs> approximately every three years. Like I said, it was seven times in 19 years. They would stick in this extra month to get the schedule back where it needed to be. Is it a, any wonder that the Jews excel at math and science? <laughs> oh, man. I couldn't imagine trying to... I mean, you know, when I was a kid, we got the little coloring things with our calendar, and there you had to color in the specific day, and, you know, on the uh, on March 17th, there was a green clover, and you colored it green, and, okay, that was tough for me. But these guys, they're adding days and subtracting days and putting entire months in, and, and, and everybody just, okay. But it, it worked. Um, now, the reason, if you look at this, the reason that, that we have uh, Easter is bouncing back and forth is because we're trying to, in, in our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, we're trying to put together, uh, keeping with respect to the church, as well as the Passover, we're trying to adjust for the Passover. Now, sometimes we're pretty darn close. Sometimes we're just way off. I want to encourage you that between the two, celebrating Easter and celebrating Passover, you're better off celebrating Passover. Okay? Celebrate Easter, but celebrate not as Easter. We're actually, what do we celebrate on Easter? What's the feast? Resurrection. Well, what's the feast? First fruits. First fruits. So, this is the calendar. The way that it works, such as it is. Um, let's jump in to the feasts. First, the Sabbath. Does anybody know what Sabbath means? No. The literal word Sabbath. In Hebrew, it means intermission. It's like pause. Like, just hold on for a sec. Take a breath. Okay? It's not... Yeah, it, it can come out, it's seventh because it comes on the seventh day, but the, the literal translation of the word is intermission. And it's, it's like God saying, okay, you need a break. You need a break. You know, God rested on the seventh day. Do you think God was tired? No. He wasn't tired. Um, 
I think looking at where, where his creation was going to take things, not too far down the road, he might have gone, oh, but I, I don't think he was tired. I think he was setting an example for us that we need a day of rest. Um, for those of you that, that uh, do not take a day of rest and recovery and restoration, you're going to burn yourselves out. Okay. God, God gave us this for our sake. Jesus goes on to say that that Sabbath was made for man. Okay, It was to give us a rest. All right. So the, the first thing that we need to understand when God is speaking about the feasts is he, he wants to draw our attention to the fact that there is one day a week that we are to... And, and what do we do on the Sabbath? What are we supposed to do? Well, did anybody, and when I was reading through it, I kept coming across the word, a holy convocation. Did anybody's Bible have a different rendering there? Sacred assembly. Sacred assembly, yeah. Yeah, um, essentially what the holy convocation means is, is that it, it's, it's, it's a set apart time for the people to come together. This, right here, is a holy convocation. Okay, we're, we're all getting together to celebrate. So, on the Sabbath, you would do no regular work, and you would spend time in the Word, you would spend time with your family. It was a day to regather yourself, to refocus your priorities from where they might have gotten off in the previous week to help establish and set them for the coming week. Okay, so right at the start, in the midst of where God's going to go on and talk about all of these sacred days, He says there is one day each week that is sacred, and you need to take that day. I have given this day to you as a gift. Use it. Okay, having owned our own business for a, a number of years, we worked seven days a week for years, and I tell you, it doesn't work. It's not worth it. Take that day. Take that day. In, in the church today, we have our Sabbath, our intermission, on Sunday. They did on, the, on Saturday because that was the last day of the week. Um, you want to talk to me about whether we should celebrate on Saturday or whether we celebrate on Sunday? Come talk to me after service because I'm going to point you to the same passage I referred to either. All the days are holy. All of them. Okay? So... Sabbath, right off the top. Um, moving on. The first feast. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Actually, uh, yeah. How do you say that, Jeannie? Pesach. Pesach. Passover. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pesach and, and, and the, the actual the Feast of Unleavened Bread is matzah. You know, the, the matzah that we have, like the communion, that's, that's the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? Um, if you have your Bible, turn with me. Um, we're going to jump over to Exodus. Um, let's go to uh, Exodus 12. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm not going to read too far in this, but I would encourage you, uh, next week we are going to dive into the feast. We're going to get in depth. We're going to start taking these things apart because I don't want you just to understand them historically. I want you to understand how they are woven into the very nature of the church. How God was establishing with these feasts a prophetic um, action. A, a picture of what he was doing in the long term. As a matter of fact, we see that, that the Passover is, is a deed that has already been accomplished. It's already been fulfilled. Okay, so I would encourage you, read this chapter. So I'm just going to start at the beginning here, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, this month, the, the month, oops, oh, it's gone, uh, Adar, um, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. 
It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he shall be, uh, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be, and, and he goes on and, and he explains this. Um, then jump down to verse 14. says, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever you shall keep it as a feast. And then see in verse 15, he says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your house, for if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So we, we see that, at, at least as far as God was concerned, when He gave the, the Feast of Passover, He was already thinking of it being a week-long feast. Okay, but we see also that the feast does not actually start on the first day, does it? Because there's, there's a day of preparation that has to take place first. If you look down here, it says... Um, Verse 3, it says, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb. Uh, when we talk about this next week, you're going to see how this whole thing played out in the light of Calvary. Okay? Because this whole thing is a picture pointing to the redemption of man. Alright? So, <clears throat> the first... Feast is Passover. Um, it is also the first of the three feasts. They're called the Shelash Regalim. Three feasts. Uh, scripture tells us that, that there were three feasts that every male in Israel was required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. This is the first one. There are two others that will follow. Uh, Jesus being a good Jew... He would have been in Jerusalem for these feasts. Okay, so um, Deuteronomy 16.16 16 gives you the, the commandment for these three feasts. So write, write that down. You can go look at it a little bit later. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll get into that later. Um, just, just as a side note, God has given this to them as their, their first month, their new year. But when do the Jews actually celebrate their new year? Right now. Rosh Hashanah. That's, that's when they celebrate their new year. We'll talk a little bit about that later when we get to that feast. But um, God established that Adar would be their January, their, their new year. And, and yet, at some point along the way, some people point to the Babylonian captivity and, and they, they make a, a fairly good um, argument that the Jews kind of had their um, calendar overlaid by the Babylonian calendar. Boy, that's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> They really want you, man. <laughs> you might go check and make sure everybody's okay. If not, tell them they should be in church. <laughs> so, so we will see um, that the Jews, for whatever reason, uh, some say because of the Babylonian captivity, some say there were some reasons within the Jewish thinking that they moved the, the New Year from the month of Adar to the month of Tishri. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. A um, couple highlights of this. One, it is a sacred assembly. No ordinary work. Okay? No regular work is to be done. Um, we need to remember that the Jewish day actually begins at sundown. Not midnight, not sun up, sundown. That's taken directly out of Genesis. It says there was evening and there was morning the first day. So the Jews look at, at sundown as being the start of the next day. Okay, uh, Whereas we look at it as midnight, they look at it as sundown. So when they're saying a holy convocation, no ordinary work, by the time the sun 
went down, you had to have all your work done because you couldn't do any of it for that next period of time. So keep that in mind. Because uh, that does play into how some of these are celebrated and how some people got kind of confused about things. Um, so, the Passover was celebrated on what day? 14th. 14th, because the 10th was Lamb Selection Day. Okay? Then the following, the 14th, would be the celebration of Passover. The next day was immediately gone into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the 14th of Adar was Passover, and then they went into the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread for seven days. Moving on, the next feast, the Feast of First Fruits. Um, there are two names by which this is known. Um, the first is uh, Spirak Halmer, which means counting the sheaves. The second, okay, Jeannie, you're going to have to help me with this. Yam Ha Bikrim. Okay. And, and that literally means the day of the first fruits. Now, what's interesting about this, when we were reading in Leviticus, um, God, let, let's turn there real quick. Leviticus 23, there's a couple of verses I want to point out to you in regard to this. Um, verse 14 in chapter 23, giving direction for this feast, he says, And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day until you have brought the offerings of your God. Now, this was celebrated um, <coughs> Here's the problem. Okay? When God established this feast, uh, we look up here in verse 9, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring a feast of the first fruit, a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that it may be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. Now here's, here's the conundrum. Here's where things get a little murky. There were two opinions as to which Sabbath that was referring to. Because remember, Sabbath is an intermission. It's a, it's a <coughs> we have the, the Sabbath at the end of the week that is a regular Sabbath. But we also have the special days where God says this will be a Sabbath for you. You shall do no ordinary work. So back in, in the time that Jesus was living, uh, there, the two opinions were held, one by the Sadducees, who predominantly ruled in the temple, <laughs> that's kind of where their, their um, dominion was. They believed that the Sabbath was actually referring to the weekly Sabbath. Okay? And so the day after that would be when you started the Feast of First Fruits. <coughs> the Pharisees, who were, who were predominantly in the outlying areas, not at the temple, more predominant in the synagogues, they believed that the Sabbath was the particular Sabbath to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which could fall on any day of the week, depending on the year, whether they skipped a month and all of that other stuff. So what, what ended up happening is you had some people saying, the feast is here and here, and it goes to here, and other people said, no, 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 it's here and it goes to here. And, and it led to a lot of confusion. It led to actually a number of issues um, it was all resolved. God took a very easy way of resolving it. He destroyed the temple. <laughs> the Sadducees went out of power. They had no base. And those that were left were the Pharisees. And, and so guess which one survives to today? They take the Sabbath, the special Sabbath, for the Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they start the Feast of First Fruits on the day after that Sabbath, which is why it jumps around in the year. Now, first fruits. This is at the time that the first of the grains were being harvested. It was barley. They would take the barley and they would take the first part of it, the first of the reaping, and they would bring it and they would present it to God. Remember, God said when He delivered the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, that the first is mine. The firstborn of the family, the firstborn of the animals, and now He's telling them the firstborn of the crops. It's mine. He goes in and he says, you're not to eat of any of this until you've given me mine. 
Okay? Not that they had to starve, they were to continue living on last year's produce. This required a measure of dependence on God. Because if you had a rough year, things could be pretty skimpy by this point. And God was telling them, don't worry about it. Just like he does with our tithes. You bring to me, regardless of how it looks, you bring to me, I will meet your need. Okay? You think you can do it on your own, you're not going to do nearly as well with 100% as I will do with 90%. So, he's telling them, bring this to me first, and I will take care of it. Alright? So the first, uh, bakarin, is, is the first fruits. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, we have one more feast. Um, go ahead and go up to the next one. The Feast of Weeks. Jeannie? Shavuot. 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 Okay, that's it. My, my Hebrew is horrible. I, I can make things out on the paper. Don't ask me to speak it. But don't ask me to interpret it either. Um, so, Shavuot. Uh, let's, let's look here in the Leviticus 23. This is the Feast of Weeks. Um... What's interesting about this is it is not only known as Shavuot, they also called it uh, Bikri because it was another first fruits. Now we have a period of days, seven weeks, at the end of the seven weeks, the next day you start the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Okay. Now keep in mind, right now, this might seem dry to you. This is Right now, all I'm doing today is I'm laying the outline so that when we get into the New Testament, we can fill that in and bring it to life. Okay? So bear with me. You've got to get these things in your mind because if you don't have those, you won't be able to appreciate what God did in the New Testament. You really won't be able to fully grasp it. Alright? So the, the Feast of Weeks is also known as a bikarim because it is a first fruits as well. And this is the first fruits in the time of the harvest of the wheat. So we have, we call this Pentecost because it's 50 days. Um, in the modern church, Pentecost has taken on an entirely different meaning than what it meant here. Why? Does anybody remember what happened at Pentecost? Anybody go to a Pentecostal church? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and one of these days when we get into this, this message, we're going to talk about where the Spirit fell and, and what was going on. Because there was a lot more going on than, than what we picked up reading with our, our Western minds. Okay, Because we don't have the tradition, the history, and the culture of the Jews. So when it talks about them being gathered together for Pentecost, they weren't getting together for the first day of the falling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't go, oh, you know what? I think today we should have Pentecost. Because most people in the church today, when they hear Pentecost, they think one of two things. Oh, those wackos. <laughs> or I should have bought a Honda. I did buy a Honda and it was not good. Okay. That, that's, that's really the two thinkings when we think about Pentecost. If you think about it at all. Some people just don't think about it. But Pentecost, Shavuot, is 50 days. And then there would be another feast that um, would bring in the first fruits of the wheat. Uh, let's, let's look at this. There's a couple things I want to point out. Um, if you look at uh, verse 17, we're talking about the Feast of Weeks. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made it two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. Ooh. What is leaven typically used for throughout Scripture? Sin. Ah, hold on to your hats because when we get into the, the Feast of Weeks, we're going to be talking about leaven. All right? So, they're bringing the wheat offering in. They offer it up. They offer up the, the lambs, the bull. Um, 50 days. It's a holy gathering. Uh, and, and we're going to see how this knits into Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts when we get there. It's, it's really awesome the way God orchestrated things. God designed them. And when God 
puts a plan in motion, nothing can mess it up. And it's awesome. All right, so jumping up. These are the, the feasts of the springtime. We're going to jump to the feast in the fall. These start on the 1st of Tishri. Um, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. i got to back up. The Feast of Weeks, that was the 2nd uh, of the Shilash Regalim, the, the three feasts that the Jewish men were required to come to Jerusalem. And, and actually, it's not required to come to Jerusalem uh, because before the temple was built, they actually had to go to Shiloh because they had to come into the presence of God. Okay, so three of the year, this was the, the Passover, and then the Feast of Weeks. There's one more that comes in the fall. So moving ahead, the fall feast, the Feast of Trumpets. Yom Teruah. Teruah. That sounds, say that again. Yom Teruah. That, doesn't that sound Irish? That sounds Irish to me. Um, okay. Teruah is actually a very specific trumpet sound. There's a, a specific note that they would blow on the shofar. It was a note of urgency. It was a warning that something is happening. Oftentimes it was a warning that the enemy is approaching the gate, but not always, because they would also blow the same terura when the king would be coming. Now, I believe that when John is talking about the coming of the Lord, and it says he will come with a loud shout, and the blowing of the trumpet, the, the, when the word there used for, in some of your Bibles it'll say cry, some it'll say shout, uh, some I think it actually says a voice of command. The word there is actually terura. It's that urgent alarm blowing of the shofar. It's that one signal that gets your attention, go, oh, oh, what's going on? Stop what you're doing, pay attention, because something's happening. And I believe that when Paul is writing about the coming of the Lord, Christians are going to hear that and they're going to go, wait a minute, we know what this is. Everybody else is going to be like, what was that? Oh, oh well. And off they'll go. So the first of Tishri, the Feast of Trumpets, um, uh, Yom Terura, it also became known as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. This is the, the, the name of, for that is uh, the head of the year. Uh, we talked a little bit about whether that was because of the Babylonian exile. Another reason that they think this might have happened is because this was such an important holy time because they're moving into the highest holy day of the year. So the blowing of the trumpets is a, a sound of preparation to get ready for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And so they believe that it just became such a significant and important date that eventually the Jews, just ignoring what God said here, bumped things over here. I think it was probably a blend. I think it was probably a number of reasons, and, and they ended up landing where they did. Okay, Because they've always considered that the mark of the spiritual year. Now they celebrate it as their, their, their physical year starts at that point. Okay. So the next day, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Does anybody remember Yom Kippur War? Anybody? Um, the nations were gathered against Israel. Um, they knew that this was the high holy day of the year. There's supposed to be no work. When we were in Israel, it was amazing. Because on the Sabbath, nothing happened. Nothing. It was really cool because the, the evening before Sabbath, as the cars were, were driving, they would come to a red light. People would get out of their cars and they would dance. And all the tourists would be plastered up against the window of their bus going, what are they doing? And they're dancing and they're celebrating out there. They're getting ready for the Sabbath. But, but nothing happens. Uh, do any of you subscribe to the Jerusalem Times? Yes. Do you ever notice we never get any reports on the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. No, nothing. You know, my, my phone never beeps on the Sabbath. But the nations around Israel knew this. They know that Yom Kippur was the highest holy day of the year. So they chose that day to attack Israel. 
You want to talk about the miracles in the Old Testament where God delivered Israel from the hands of mighty enemies. He's still doing it today. God has delivered Israel time after time after time. When the odds were overwhelmingly against them, God has delivered them. Take a little bit of a history jog back. Look at the history of Israel from 1948 to today and you will see the hand of God on that nation doing what he said he would do for his people. All right? So, Yom Kippur, the highest holy day of the year. It is the day of atonement. This is the day when the Holy of Holies would be entered. The blood would be taken in and sprinkled on the, the altar before God, the, the mercy seat. The high priest was only allowed to do this once a year and he had to prepare himself first because his sins had to be atoned for before he could go in and make atonement for the people of Israel. Okay. Now what's interesting about this, do you guys know about the two goats? I'm going to try and get this right. Uh, Jeannie, do you know the names of the goats, what they called them? Yeah. I got the spelling here. Go ahead. C-H-A-T-A-T. Say it again. C-H-A-T-A-T. Okay. Chat that. One of them is Azazel. Azazel is the other one. The first one uh, probably is pronounced Chatat, but it's Chat at. All right. <laughs> the, the two goats were brought in, okay, and the, the high priest would choose by lot between the two goats. One was taken and sacrificed for the atonement. His blood was shed for the atonement, and the priest would take him in, he would, he would sacrifice the animal, he would take the blood into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle it on the, the, uh, the uh, uh, mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant, and then he would come back out, and he would lay his hand on the other goat, the Azazel, and this, this one is, is what the King James calls the scapegoat. Okay. Now there's some dispute as to whether it's actually a scapegoat, Azazel refers to the scapegoat or to some other entity. But, but the high priest would lay his hands, he would confess the sins of Israel, and then he would release the goat into care of a particular person. Now, Scripture just says that the goat was to be released into the wilderness. Okay? Yeah. On that goat rode all the sin of the people. And it was taken away from the people. It was put out in the wilderness. The Mishnah actually tells us that the, the person who was supposed to go with the goat, make sure it didn't come back into the people and bring the sins back, would actually take it to a place, a high cliff, and throw it off the cliff and kill it. That way the sins couldn't come back to the people. Okay, but that's, that's not a scriptural reference. That's one of the rabbinic teachings in the Mishnah. Okay, so the, the two goats, one is being offered that our sins would be covered. This, this is according to the Hebrew teaching. The other is, is bearing those sins away from the people. Okay, and, and you guys might want to look at how this fits with Calvary. Okay, because Jesus managed to do both as the lamb. The perfect lamb. All right. So uh, I'm gonna. Oh gosh. I'm gonna wrap this up real quick. The last day, the feast, the feast of booths. Sukkot. Yeah. Sukkot. Sukkot. I wish they would spell it phonetically. <laughs> I'm not even close. This is the third of the Shilash Regalim. So this is the day that the the, the men had to go up to Israel. Uh, it was celebrated from the 15th of Tishri to the 22nd. The 22nd marked the end of the holy days of the fall. Okay, um, This was a permanent reminder of their time wandering, living in the tents. They were required to come to Jerusalem. They were required, if they lived in Jerusalem, they were required to go out of their house and live in a tent. Okay? This was a reminder that God delivered them and for a time they lived in tents and he took care of them out in the desert, out in the wilderness. Okay, This was required every year. Um, this also was the time that the last of the harvest of the year would be brought into Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was also a bickering. Interesting note, the Puritans that settled in the, the 
uh, Americas were very devout studiers of Scripture, and it is believed that they chose the fall for their time of Thanksgiving because the Jews at Sukkot celebrated their Thanksgiving. Okay, so just a little bit of history there. Uh, our Thanksgiving was really based on the idea of Sukkot. All right, so we have the six feasts. Uh, there are two others real quick. There's Purim, there's Hanukkah. We'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, if you would like a copy of the calendar, let me know. I can make copies for you uh, with a little bit of an explanation down at the bottom. Okay, so today I have very roughly sketched a picture for you. Starting next week, God willing, we're going to start coloring in that picture. Because all of these things were pointing, they were a huge neon sign pointing to what God was intending to do. All of these things were only in part, but Christ is going to be the fulfillment of all of these. Okay? And we'll get into those next week. We'll start taking a look at how this was done. Amen? Amen. Uh, I would encourage you, start reading... Uh, Exodus chapter 12 so you can kind of get an idea of the Passover uh, and, and we'll develop that some more next week. Father, we thank you. Father, that there is not one idle or useless word that you've given us. We thank you, Father, that your word is alive. From Genesis to Revelation, your word is alive. And I ask, Father, that you would make us a people that would have attentive minds, hearts and minds that hunger and thirst for your word, longing to know more about you. I ask God that, that you would enlighten us, that you would open our minds to those things that we need to know. Help us, Father, to be good students of your word. Help us, Father, to be good disciples and followers. I just ask, Father, your blessing over this series that, that God, it would be rich and meaningful. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.